So is this what's going on now in Washington? Yeah. Yeah. Through this campaign. Yeah. One of the one of the problems I have with the book um, is that I keep. And one of the things I kept having through this book is I would keep making up stuff, and then it would be overtaken by events. Like the, 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 uh, uh, like the book has a hacking scandal that I wrote in right. before the hacking scandal broke, and again and again. I mean, uh, the, uh, we do on uh, my blog. I have a feature called "Life Imitates Patriots," where somebody will do or say something that seems like a passage out of the book, and it's for real. For real. Um, uh, you've also said that you hope this book inspires some kind of change, but th that's not happening in the in the United States. We don't see, even as disgusted as many voters are with what they see playing out on the political stage, it doesn't seem to resonate with the political institutions or, and the politicians. Yeah, but th this is where I'm going to dissent from my um, my colleague Noah. Um, I, change comes. I I I don't think um, nothing is fixed, and I ne I don't believe in decline stories. I don't believe in um, that anything is inevitable. People choose. And what has happened, um, the American system is very susceptible to corruption. More so, uh, parliamentary systems are susceptible to abuse of authority. Uh, the congressional systems are susceptible to corruption. because There power is so much money. That was the most astonishing thing for me going to the United States was just how much money is involved in every single campaign. I remember covering a, a Democrat who was trying to get the Democratic Senate, Senate, yeah. Senate nomination in Maryland. He spent more money on trying to get the nomination than a Canadian political party would spend in an entire campaign. <laughs> that's, that's absolutely right. But think about it this way. Supposing you're a corrupt, sinister interest group um, and you, you want to corrupt the Canadian political system. Well, it would be worth your while to, to bribe the prime minister. Um, it might be worth, if you could, it might be worthwhile to try to bribe a relevant cabinet minister. But what a waste of money to bribe an MP. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, they can do nothing. <laughs> so. <laughs> You've got a very finite set of targets. And, a and after a while, it's like Henry Kissinger's joke about the nuclear weapons. Do you want to make the rubble bounce? I mean, uh, <laughs> that how much is it worthwhile to spend, even if you could? Whereas in the United States, there are so many points where uh, money can make a difference because the power is so distributed. So that's why the American system is more open, it's less authoritarian than parliamentary systems are, but it's more susceptible to corruption. But uh, it is also susceptible to great waves of popular reform that happen at regular intervals in a way that um, don't happen in parliamentary uh, systems and where people decide um, that they need institutional change. And what I, I am convinced that, a, that such a movement of institutional change is in the wings right now, just, just waiting. And I think it is going to come out of, I had thought this depression would, would bring it forward, and, and that hasn't happened. Um, but I think perhaps the crisis is too severe. But um, I mean, it really is bizarre that you can't, presidents can't staff their governments, uh, that uh, the, uh, the Scale, the scale of the money that has to be spent, and the candidates are not any happier about having to spend their time raising the money either. No. I, congressmen spend more time raising money, it seems to me, than they actually do legislating. The, the, their positions on committees depend on how much they raise. That's for sure. There's a, there's, there, there's, um, a scene where um, Senator Hazen has to do, this is something that senators do, that you go to, you're not allowed to raise money in government facilities. So uh, the, the Democrats and the Republicans each have a headquarters very close to Capitol Hill, and you drive there, and uh, the purpose, these headquarters are very large, you think, why do they need to be so big? And there's some dining facilities, but the main thing is there are all of these cubicles where senators and congressmen can make phone calls uh, off government premises asking for money. And um, the, the good senator in the book is on the Senate Banking Committee, so he's able to raise a lot of money, and on on his way uh, to this thing, he asked Walter, he has, it's his dialing day, and they will spend typically half a day, two days a week uh, doing this, plus all their time in their cars when they're being driven around. Uh, and well, he, he stops off, uh, to, um, he asked Walter, because he has his, Walter's new, to stop off at a hardware store and pick him up a, a set of steak knives. And Walter says, why? And then um, they do the dialing for dollars, and there's another senator who's sort of a rival within the party of Senator Hazen's who raises the second largest number of dollars, and Hazen presents him with a set of steak knives, which, as you'll remember from the movie, second prize is a set of steak knives. <laughs> <laughs> Third prize is you're fired. <laughs> um, put some of this into the, into the political campaign that we're, that we're seeing now. Why is it that it seems that the voices on the extreme, particularly on the conservative side, um, have so much more currency right. than the voices 
Well, this, of the, of the, I would argue the, the moderate majority. Well, this is an example of where life does imitate patriotism. I mean, Mitt Romney is no General Pulaski, but uh, when he emerged uh, as a national political figure uh, before the 2008 election, that his profile was one of somebody uh, who was just a super competent person, very good at things, um, had done an um, extraordinary job of preserving security at the Democratic Convention in 2004, um, had brought about this uh, health care reform uh, in Massachusetts where he had, cover I mean, Massachusetts already had very high levels of health care coverage. He made it very nearly universal without requiring any additional revenues by um, uh, a variety of administrative changes. Uh, he. Uh, handled very competently. They had they were burying their equivalent of the Gardner Expressway, which was a project that just went horribly wrong uh, and wasted a lot of money. And he said it right. Uh, he just was someone who was good at things. He seemed a natural administrator, a natural organizer. Um, I worked on the Giuliani campaign that year, and Rudy Giuliani, who didn't like uh, Mitt Romney very much, once cracked in sort of a bitter moment. Still, whatever you say, you have to admit he'd make the greatest Secretary of Transportation of all time. <laughs> uh, and, um, now what happens to him, and that's, and that's the campaign he had in mind to lead, and just a, a note on this, that uh, Mitt Romney was very close to his father, George Romney, the governor of Michigan, who many of you may remember, and George Romney had been, in 1964, someone who refused to endorse Barry Goldwater. He said, I accept the nomination, but I do not endorse it, because Goldwater had opposed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, and that was the part of the party that Mitt came from, and he and his father were extremely close. Uh, so what happens, he ventures into national politics again in this cycle, and he is pushed, and he is pushed, and he is, the, the forces from within that, that affect Gen the Pulaski presidency are the same kind of forces that remake Mitt Romney. And whereas in the book, General Pulaski fights them, and then, to give away the plot, is defeated by them. Uh, Romney, under, probably with the wit to understand, he's not a soldier, so he's a little bit more, if you can't beat him, join him. Uh, he's beaten, he has joined them. And they have remade him and reinvented him. And if there's a feeling out there that Mitt Romney is not an authentic person, I mean, it's a large part because... It's true. Yeah. Now, it's, it, he's saying things that <laughs> Well, he, because he doesn't... Yes, I, you've just explained, yeah. Now, the one thing to bear in mind here is politicians are different from you and me, in that, that you would say, well, does he mean these things? And I said, well, for most of us, first you mean something and then you say it. Um, in the world of politics, it works the other way around. Um, <laughs> that, and I said, it, it takes, I said, actually, I, I hope this doesn't come out the right way, but it, it takes a certain strength of character to be a conscious hypocrite. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, that you, you know, you have to really have to remember what you think. You have to keep it separate, and yet uh, it takes a lot of self knowledge. It, that what mo happens to most people is they they don't they don't want to be conscious hypocrites. So they, there's something you need to say, so you believe it. At least by the 38th or 43rd or 118th time you say it, you've come to believe it. But what does it take to persuade someone? And you clearly have some admiration for Romney. What would it have taken to persuade him? that he had to speak out of that other side of his mouth to say what he doesn't believe. Um, it would have had to have taken, and this is where I, one of the reasons I don't blame him as much as other people do. Um, I, well, my line I use when I talk to Republican audiences is, is that the party has a crisis of followership. Um, it would have taken an infrastructure of people. When, when George Romney fought Barry Goldwater, he did not fight alone. He fought as the representative, not only of an important part of the party, but of the larger part of the party. Uh, and uh, he could go on being governor of Mich Michigan and be reelected governor of Michigan um, and be a serious contender for president in 1968. And the Goldwater people were ultimately able to veto him, thanks also to some mistakes of his own. Uh, but he could be an independent force. The infrastructure, the, the, the faction within the party that supported George Romney, it just doesn't exist anymore. And so Mitt Romney, who wants to be president and doesn't want to be a martyr, um, uh, says, well, who here can deliver for me? I have to go with them because you, David Frum, you don't have any battalions. And these people have not only battalions, but regiments, brigades, and divisions. But you don't think that even the Reagan Republicans, or the great moderate middle, in fact, is larger than what we're seeing and hearing from Romney and, and others? Um, it, it is, and that's why Romney has a lot of general election troubles, but because of the two-stage American process, where first you must win a nomination, and then you must win um, an election. Uh, and what has also happened in the United States is, 
um, the country, you, and you can track, this is not just impressionistic, you can track this with all kinds of data. Uh, the United States went left between about 2005 and 2009, and all, not dramatically, but public opinion shifted in all kinds of ways that you could measure. But since 2009, it has moved sharply to the right. And the driver, when you break out, you break out the question, um, uh, is the, that various questions people have about essentially government as a force in society. Is it a force for good or a force for ill? Uh, that the, uh, over the, the, the generation that is over 80 was by far and away the most conservative part of the society. What's happened since 2000, in, in 2009 there was a noticeable gap between the attitudes of people between 60 and 80 and those over 80. And that gap has disappeared that the baby boomers, the leading edge of the baby boomers, have become just as conservative as the people in the so-called silent generation, the people now over 80. And that uh, shift, and I, what I think it's driven by, is it's driven by this debate over the allocation of retirement resources. Uh, that what that generation nearing retirement says, if they are, it isn't they want libertarianism by any means, but they want to reject any, they see that the resources of the state are under pressure and they want to defeat any new claims on the resources of the state to protect the old claims that they're about to become eligible for. And that has led to both ideological bitterness, economic, I mean it's led to a lot of confusion because it's, it's libertarian language in defense of the interests of the incumbent beneficiaries of, of existing state action. But um, the fact that you know, the people express themselves in ways don't, that don't make sense doesn't mean that the feelings aren't true. Right. And those are the people that vote. <laughs> those are the people that vote. Right. Help me, help me understand the gender gap. Because Obama clearly has yes. uh, much more support, did in the last election too, but much more support among women. Yes. It's not just that, I mean, it's not that there aren't conservative women. There I are mean, conservative. <laughs> the conservative women are different from conservative men. Um, all right, so let, let me uh, deal with the. There, I think there are at least three things that, that drive the gender cap. Um, uh, first, and one of the things that is most important, is that women are uninterested in, to generalize, are uninterested in the part of politics which is a um, substitute for the NFL. <laughs> uh, uh, that, that is, a lot of people are interested, a lot of men follow, by, and that, yes. that's the, the, the... They want the strategy, they the, want the play. Yeah, they want, they and want our play. team, and how our team is sure to win, and, and, you know, who are the players. And, like, at some level, you need, really do need to ask, I mean, to the person who's watching, spending hours and hours following a presidential election, it's not, why do you bother? I mean, if you're just, even if, if, if you assume your time is worth, you know, some modest figure, $40, $50 an hour, uh, and then you figure the number of hours you spent on the presidential election, is it possible that any policy difference that either of these guys will make for you or against you can possibly be worth? And how many hours can you watch Wolf Blitzer? Right. <laughs> but, so, so, so women, uh, so, but that means that women don't watch so much the cable news shows. Right. And they don't get dragged into the dramas and hysteria and the impending end of the American Republic if our opponents win that you get if you are a big consumer of this kind of programming. So that's, that's one cause of the gender gap. The second thing is we need to understand that um, uh, married women and unmarried women are very different from one another. Married women, uh, unmarried women uh, tend to be either, uh, they tend to be poor, they tend to be more economically vulnerable, um, either they're, um, old, they're either widows and older or they're minorities who don't get married uh, in the first place before they have children, have less opportunity to do that. They, they need government more. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that if you're a Republican you watch is you watch how am I doing among married women? And if you fall below 50% among married women, you're just dead. Uh, and if you can, but if you, if, if you don't mind the gender gap so much as long as you're supported among married women, although married women as a proportion of all women are declining, uh, both, uh, for two, both because under economic pressure there's less marriage in the first place, and second because as the baby boomers uh, retire, the baby boom men die first. Uh, uh, and uh, so that's, that's the second reason. And, and then the, uh, the third reason um, is Again, I'm going to hazard a generalization, but there's data behind this. The conflict style of politics, women don't like. And uh, the, the, as the parties become more committed to conflict, and as the Republicans in particular have made conflict a defining theme of their, um, of their style, that is very off-putting to women voters who, again, to generalize, there are exceptions obviously, but um, as a group prefer a more consensus-oriented style of politics to a more conflict-based. 
the point is that the consensus-oriented uh, politics, uh, a, uh, we were talking about Twitter before, hmm. you know, the, the, one of the reasons Mitt Romney got into this trouble over the Libya and Cairo um, crises is that he had been receiving a lot of advice from everybody on, on cable TV over the past three days that his problem was that he had not taken, the, the phrase is, take the fight to Obama, meaning say more negative things. I mean, that we hate him, there's a great, the great and good American people out there must surely hate them, but they're not activated because you haven't said enough how much you hate them. So you need to say more how much you hate them and how incompetent he is. And so he had been reading that just before he released that statement. And I, I read about this that, that it is, you know, it's just that the idea that the American public wants to see a jumpy, angry, bitter, and divisive person uh, with the, the, but, the finger on the nuclear button is just wrong. I mean, that's what, those are characteristics that make you an excellent radio talk show host, uh, but that, uh, they don't make you a good president. But the pe when the radio talk show hosts have so much influence over a, a veto-wielding section of the party, and we see that again and again, that they drive people toward a conflict model of politics, even when as Mitt Romney must, and as I know the people around Mitt Romney do, even when they know it's not really in their self-interest. They just can't get off the train. I say, we even saw that change in Obama after he came to office, too. He became a more conflict-driven right. president. What kind of president do you think Mitt Romney would be? I, you know, I used to know the answer to that question. Um, <laughs> uh, what I used to say was he would be like the elder George Bush, which is... Uh, he would have a completely transactional view of the people who got him elected. And then uh, the moment he was elected, he would say, now I'm going to be the greatest Secretary of Transportation of all time. Um, uh, see, I'll see my consultants in four years. Uh, and I will rely on the instruments of control in the Republican Party to hold on to Fox News and to keep them well behaved, as they generally were, were well behaved during the Bush years when Bush did things they, they didn't like. Uh, but I think two things. I think what has happened is, is one, that the... Um, uh, there's been a rebellion, and the, the talk show host and the conservative entertainment complex has become much more powerful, and they're not inclined to give up their power. Um, and second, I think Romney has shown himself as a weaker person than I thought he was. And so I'm now less confident that the conservative entertainment complex will lose its power over him uh, after, after he, a Romney victory. But you'll still vote for him? Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Um, I, because... Uh, elections are about the future, mm -hmm. uh, as to co coin a cliche, um, to repeat a cliche. And you know, ultimately, you know, you're buying a brand, and you have two general paths about the way society should be organized. And if the, and, and if the, if the core ballot question is, is do you want a government with more scope for business and entrepreneurship and less government, or more scope for government and more burdens on business and entrepreneurship, I'm going to be in the first group. Um, and I, that, that broad brand question, that's the way most people vote, that they ignore all of the noise and all of the drama, and they think, I'm going to be getting broadly, you know, I, um, you know, I, I, it, you know, is it a breath mint or is it a floor wax? I know whether I want a breath mint or I know whether I want a floor wax. And if you're in camp floor wax, you, you vote that way. Um, that, where you bump up is every once in a while you, you get into a situation where somebody really, even though they represent your broad outlook, does seem like they're unable to deal with the demands of the job. And that happened to Jimmy Carter in 1980, where a lot of the people who, would norm who voted for him in 76 deserted him in 80 because they thought he couldn't do the job. How real is that risk, do you think, for Obama? Uh, it, it was six months, eight months ago, it was very real. It gets less real each week, that the Democrats are coming home. Um, so his problem, he has no challenger, he has nobody to his left um, complaining about the drone attacks or not enough stimulus. His problem is, uh, do his people come out to vote? Uh, because his people are younger, poorer, they have suffered the brunt of the election. People. I shouldn't say people, Americans where vote, voting turnout is low, they vote when they believe their vote will be effective. And they don't vote when they believe their vote is ineffective. It's demoralization that makes people stay home. And the Obama base is demoralized, that they voted for him in 2008, hoping that things would be better. And for most of them, things are not better. Well, and even in places where presumably they are slightly better, you're, they're in the awkward position where you, I mean, any of the, poly, where for the Democrats, you can't sort of say, well, things have improved because things are still so awful. I right. mean, you know, you've taken two steps when you need to take ten. It's very hard to claim any uh, Right. Well, that, that's one of the reasons you heard, you heard so much about the auto bailout at the Democratic Convention, because one state where things are noticeably better is Ohio. 
Um, and you, in Ohio, you can say things are better without sounding like an insensitive jerk, um, because it's, 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 be it's better enough. Better enough. <laughs> that's not really good enough in politics. It's not good enough. Well, that's, that's why he's in trouble. Um, that's why he's in, he's in, a, he's a lo in a lot of trouble. Um, that obviously, uh, you know, he, you, uh, what you want to be able to do is go to the electorate and say it's morning in America, and, and he can't do that. Um, I just have one final, a couple of final questions I want to ask you. One, you're pretty harsh on think tanks in this book too. I know you were part of one. Do you think well, now... I'm a, dis I'm a disgruntled ex-employee. <laughs> so that gives you liberty to speak. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it, but they're the people often in the media, that's who you go to, right? That's when you want a point of view, that's who you well, call. Well, and there are excellent think tanks in Washington. I do want to stress that. And there are, there, even at the less excellent think tanks, um, there are excellent people who are doing good and important work. Um, but you, uh, w one of the questions that um, was bound to occur to somebody um, was, you know, think tanks were occupied a halfway uh, step between universities on the one hand and PR agencies on the other. That if you are um, a donor and you give money to the Kennedy School at um, Harvard, there's no telling what they will say. Uh, if you give that same money to a PR agency, you know exactly what they'll say because they say what you tell them to say. Um, and think tanks were somewhere on that grid. And what some of the think tanks, some liberal, some conservative, uh, more on the conservative side have noticed, is you can raise, if you move your position on that index a little more toward the PR side of things, you can raise a lot more money. And uh, there has been a um, noticeable change in the output of, of, these, of these institutions. Uh, and you know, one of the things when, when I got sacked, uh, one of the reasons that I did the things that got me sacked was uh, I thought, you know, if I'm going to be working at a PR firm, I want to be paid a lot more. Uh, <laughs> and, and I'm not saying I could never have gone into PR. I'm not saying that had I made a different life path, that I couldn't have gone into a life path where you give me a big piece of money uh, and I'll say, you know, the best arguments I can for your point of view, but for this salary, I'm going to say what I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're, and we're so glad you do. Um, but given all of that, and I know you've been a critic uh, of, your, of the conservative movement for a long time, at some point don't you feel just like throwing up your hands in disgust? Only alternate Wednesdays uh, between the... <laughs>